<laughs> yeah. Okay, so welcome to the Digital Sciences for Drug Discovery meeting. Um, I just, yeah. So this is a Berlin seminar series that was actually started by Andrea Volkammer, Clara Christ, and Andreas Bender. Um, and it's meant to be a networking event for all people being involved in digital drug discovery. I'm very happy uh, that you can start an, another of these events today. Uh, so for all those participating online, we just, they just see me now. So we have about 40 participants here on site. Um, and online, Andreas, do you know how many people you have online? 54 at the moment. 54 at the moment. Okay, that's great. So I hope you can see everything. If not, uh, um, I'm just happy if you say something. Uh, we have two excellent speakers today. Uh, so I'm happy to welcome Ariane Lunes Alves from the Technical University of Berlin at the moment, or recently <laughs> joining. She's going to talk about protein ligand binding kinetics and drug design, uh, prediction of kinetic rates for kinases. I think this is a super interesting topic that everybody uh, of us thinks about in drug discovery. Can we also predict kinetics uh, up to a certain point? And the second topic will be on machine learning from uh, the new group of art for artificial intelligence here founded in Berlin from Mikhail Andronov on re re reagent prediction with a transformer and its benefits for re reaction product prediction. After the talks, we'll have uh, two networking sessions, one virtual networking session and one in person. So whoever wants to join, we're going to uh, Luisa in Dahlem. So it's about uh, 200 meters down the road. Um, and have the chance also to talk to the speakers, I hope. So what is DigiDrug? DigiDrug has the aim to bring together everybody who is working on digital sciences and drug discovery. Um, Andreas, Clara, Andrea, who founded that, uh, explicitly formulated that in a broader way so that we can also incorporate modern methods and not only classical drug discovery here. Um, so it's just a networking platform where everybody can meet. We also had multi-site meetings in the past. Um, so that's also why we stick to this hybrid format, uh, because we also want to integrate other universities, uh, not only center to Berlin. So we're going to have, we always have scientific talks, followed by socializing, also the socializing part should be important. Uh, who are we? So uh, it's actually initiated by these three, so by Clara Christ from Bayer, uh, Andrea Volkammer from now Saarland University, she was originally uh, at Charité, that's why it's a little bit Berlin centric at the moment, um, and also Andreas Bender, uh, who is at Cambridge University and now uh, at Pangea Botanica, and myself, my name is Gerhard Wolverhin. So a few housekeeping remarks still. So the next event date, so we plan uh, an interval of about three to four months uh, for these talks, and it's approximately the format that we have today. So we're typically going to have uh, one to four talks, depending on how many sites are involved. Uh, so please check the website, digidrug.net, where we are going to announce the next talks and the next topics. The main meeting will be recorded. Um, if the speakers agree, we'll make them public afterwards. So also if you ask questions in presence, not in the chat, so the chat will not be published, but if you ask questions in presence, it might be that they are published afterwards, so be aware of this. So if you don't want it, please contact us and uh, tell us that we should delete those questions if you're shy of them. And uh, we want to allow on-site questions and also questions in the chat. Uh, since in that format, we saw that it is nicer if we just talk to each other, We'll try to allow questions directly after the talk, so you can directly just speak up and say something. Um, if it becomes too much, we're just going to reduce that and uh, organize this by the chat. But uh, the ideal format that we try now today is that you just speak up and ask the question so we can initiate discussions directly afterwards. And after the last talk, for those that are online, so please stay online uh, so you can meet old friends again. Uh, and here in presence, uh, we are going to go to meet physically, physically in uh, Domene Dale, uh, in Domene Dale and Luisa. So if you wish, if you have an interest to present your science at the next meeting, please contact us. Uh, it would be really nice. Uh, we are always searching for novel, interesting topics that we can include in the program. Um, and also if you have an idea on how we could invite, so it would be also nice to contact us. 
Okay, so um, then we come to the first talk. So it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Ariane Nunes Alves. Uh, she studied biology and biochemistry and did her B uh, PhD in biochemistry in Sao Paulo in uh, 2017. Uh, from 2018 to 2021, she moved to Germany to Hitz uh, in Heidelberg, where she did a postdoc. Um, and during that time, she did several international research days, uh, one at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, um, one at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, one at Cornell University. And her research interest is how small organic molecules bind to proteins, right? So I hope it's not too general. Okay, so I'm <laughs> looking forward to your talk. Just switch. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for this kind introduction, Gerhard, and thank you so much for this invitation. I'm very excited to be here with you today to talk a little bit of my favorite topics, uh, drug design, uh, kinetics, and kinases. Uh, so uh, most of you here are biochemists, I guess. So uh, we all know that uh, ligands and small molecules can bind to proteins and activate signaling pathways that can lead to a lot of uh, things uh, inside cells. Like we can start uh, a signal to that leads to cell proliferation or cell death, for instance. And the pharmaceutical industry, of course, exploits this and design exogenous ligands that can either activate or usually inhibit proteins. And then uh, to address this in a more quantitative perspective, we can think uh, what exactly is a good binder. And for this, uh, we can look at uh, thermodynamics and kinetics uh, measurement. So most people usually address this question by the perspective of thermodynamics. So in equilibrium conditions, we can talk about the dissociation constant Kd or the binding free energy delta Gb, which basically measures the affinity of the ligand for the protein. So for instance, Kd uh, is given by this fraction, uh, P is the concentration of protein and L the concentration of ligand uh, in equilibrium. And one important aspect here is that Kd and delta Gb are state functions. So it's enough to look at the end states uh, to make predictions of either Kd or delta Gb. But what I want to highlight for you here today is kinetics. So uh, in steady state conditions, uh, we can talk about the association rate constant K on, which is basically the rate of complex formation and K off the dissociation rate constant, which is basically the opposite, the rate of complex dissociation uh, and it's also common to refer not to K off, but the residence time uh, tau. And what makes uh, kinetics so special is that kinetic rates are better equilibrium, uh, are better descriptors of non-equilibrium systems. And a very special class of non-equilibrium systems are us and our cells. So our cells are constantly dragging glucose and O2 from the environment, converting it to CO2, water, and energy. And what makes it a bit challenging to study is that uh, K off and K on are not state functions. So they, in other words, they depend on the path we use to move from the bound state to the unbound state or vice versa. And I really want you to remember for the rest of this talk, uh, the definitions of K on or the residence time because this will be the topic for the rest of the talk. And binding kinetics is an emerging topic in drug design. So the idea of optimizing uh, drugs by looking at the drug protein residence time was first proposed in this uh, work here from 2006. And something else that further highlights it is this recent project, Kinetics for Drug Discovery, or K4DD, which is a past project. I was not part of it, but my former boss, Rebecca Wade, was. And this was basically... Uh, a collaboration between uh, pharmaceutical companies and also uh, universities, not only in Germany, but in the whole Europe to develop uh, experimental and also computational methods to further uh, understand and study binding kinetics, especially uh, K of values in the context of drug design. And the reason uh, that kinetics is so uh, special is that kinetic rates uh, in many cases can be better correlated with in vivo efficacy, as we'll see in this example here. Uh, 
in a few seconds. So uh, the whole idea is that if we have a longer tau value, this means that the drug spends more time bound to the protein. And as a consequence, we have a longer physiological effect and less of target binding. So if you look at this example here, uh, this comes from this paper from 2012. And the researchers here were basically looking at inhibitors of the adenosine uh, HOA receptor. And here in the y-axis, they were measuring uh, the efficacy of these different inhibitors inside cells. And here uh, in the x-axis, uh, we see uh, and the logarithm of Ki, which is basically the inhibition constant, which is a measure, uh, an equilibrium measurement, while here we have the residence time, which is a kinetic measurement or a non equilibrium measurement. And if we look at the R square values, the coefficients of determination, uh, we can see that there is a higher uh, correlation between the residence time and the efficacy uh, when we look at residence times. And the business of my career is basically to use computational methods to project kinetic rates. And not only me, but there are a lot of people working on this, uh, especially uh, given that this was uh, drawing a lot of attention in drug design. And there are broadly two classes of methods we can use to project kinetic rates. We can think about uh, data-driven methods or machine learning, which is quite trendy nowadays. And the disadvantage here is that you really need to have a lot of experimental data to train your methods, but once you have your trained methods, you can make predictions in seconds. And on the other hand, and the topic of my talk today will be about physics-based methods, uh, which are basically molecular dynamic simulations combined with enhanced sampling methods, which I'll talk about in a second. The advantage here, we don't need experimental data to make predictions, but the problem here is that the predictions can take days to happen because we need to run simulations and not one, but many to make uh, reasonable predictions. And if you want to know more, I recently wrote a couple of reviews here uh, about computational methods for kinetic rates. And now uh, talking a little bit about the methods that I, uh, that I use uh, for the results I'll show in this presentation, I, the methods are basically molecular dynamic simulations combined with enhanced sampling. So molecular dynamic simulations, uh, we basically use uh, the Newtonian equation of motion, as you can see here, to propagate uh, the motion of uh, the atoms uh, in the system. So A is the acceleration over the atom, F is the force over the atom, and M is the mass of this atom. And then for the force, uh, we need a description of the interaction energy between the atoms in the system. And this is achieved uh, basic, basically by something that we call a force field that has uh, terms to describe the bonded interactions and the non-bonded interactions. Uh, I'm not going to a lot of detail here, but the bonded interactions are basically uh, described by the bonds, uh, the angles and the torsions. Uh, and you can see the equations here and the shapes uh, of the energy as a function of the distance uh, of the angle or the torsion. And we also have uh, non-bonded terms to describe the interactions between the atoms. So we have basically a Leland jones term to describe the Van der Waals interactions and uh, an electrostatic equation to describe uh, the electrostatic uh, interactions. And something I want to highlight to you here, and which will be the topic of the next slide, uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, usually achieve a time scale of nanoseconds of microseconds, sometimes milliseconds if you are lucky enough to use an Enton machine from the eShaw. But let's say simulations usually achieve the microseconds time scale. And this poses a challenge to study binding kinetics. Because uh, while molecular dynamic simulations are restricted to microseconds, uh, unbinding experimentally may take milliseconds or even more time to happen. And that's why we usually have to combine molecular dynamic simulations with some enhanced sampling method that will, will in other words, increase the chances that we will see the event that we want to see, which in this case is ligand dissociation. In this very particular case, we are going to talk about a tau range, uh, which means a tau random acceleration molecular dynamics. So this was developed by uh, my former uh, boss, Professor Rebecca Wade. And mm -hmm. if you want to know more, you can see uh, the previous papers here from 2018 and 2020. So uh, the basic idea of this method is to uh, uh, facilitate ligand dissociation by applying a force of random orientation in the center of mass of the ligand. So first of all, we have to equilibrate uh, our protein ligand complex in solvent. 
And then we start applying the force represented by this arrow here. So after time delta t, uh, we check the displacement of the ligand molecule uh, in comparison to the starting point. So if this uh, displacement is larger than a threshold, then we keep this random orientation. But if this displacement uh, is, is smaller than this threshold, then uh, we change the orientation of the force randomly. And then we keep doing these steps of uh, checking the displacement and changing or not the orientation of the force and then propagating the system until we have the event we want to see that in this case is ligand dissociation. And then uh, we do this not one, but many times, and in the end, we can estimate uh, relative uh, residence times for a group of different complexes. And we can compare these relative residence times if we are using the same force for dissociation for different ligands. So that's the whole idea here. So one important point that I want you to have in mind is that because we are applying a force and we are not correcting uh, for this force, what we get in the end is a relative residence time. So this relative residence time will not reproduce the experimental residence time, but we can achieve the same ranking that we have in the experiments. And that's the uh, nice thing about this method. First of all, it's very simple. And then uh, second, we can use it in a high throughput mode and rank uh, tens of ligands by residence times. And just to give you an idea of this method here, uh, how or so there are many, many methods to predict residence times in the literature, either relative residence times or absolute residence times. And Taurand uh, is here. So here we can see uh, the experimental residence times uh, for complexes that were used for the different methods you can see here. And here we have the simulation time uh, required to make predictions. So you can see that one of the great advantages of Taurand is that it requires like tens or hundreds of nanoseconds to make predictions. But this is only the second fastest method because we still have this method here, uh, targeted molecular dynamics, also developed here in Germany by Stefan Wolf. So Germany is a cool place for residence times. And okay, so now moving, uh, I hope you understood the methods, Taurand. Uh, and now we're going to talk about kinases. So in this particular work, uh, we'll talk about these two kinases, FAK. Oh, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> I'm still sharing, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, drama. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about FAK and PYK2. So FAK is the focal adhesion kinase and PYK2, the proline rich uh, tyrosine kinase 2, which has 61% sequence identity to FAK. And they are both involved in cell uh, migration and survival. So previously in the literature uh, in 2018, there was uh, this inhibitor was discovered. Uh, and it was a very interesting inhibitor uh, because it had, it had selectivity against FAK. So you can see here by the ICP2 values that this inhibitor uh, was, uh, had a higher, so had, uh, more selectivity against FAK uh, as evidenced by this smaller IC50 value here. And then uh, what we wanted to do in this work is to get mechanistic insights about the selectivity between FAK, PYK2, and see if we could find other uh, inhibitors that would be as selective or even more selective than this uh, inhibitor that was ident identified here in a previous work. And this work is already published, and if you want to read more, you can check this paper here from 2021. Uh, so first of all, uh, this was a collaboration uh, with other groups, experimental groups, and also the pharmaceutical industry. And then the first thing we did was to design uh, this series of inhibitors uh, to play around uh, and try to find out which would be the features important for selectivity. So this was the basic uh, motive uh, of the molecule. Inhibitor one was basically the inhibitor you saw in the previous slide. And then we had different replacements in these two regions here, R1, R2, and R3. And then what we did, uh, the residence times, the experimental residence times, you can see them here. They were uh, measured by surface plasma resonance. And we applied tau Renzi to compute the, the relative residence times here in this axis. Uh, and in green, we have uh, the residence times for PYK2, and in red, the residence times for FAK. 
And we can see that Tau Renzi could uh, make a good prediction of the residence time here, as we can see by this R square of 0 0.921. And the inhibitors we were looking for uh, were basically these inhibitors here that have uh, a large residence time or specificity against FAK, but not against uh, PYK2. And then uh, once we saw that our simulations reproduced the experiments, we moved on to do some, a lot of data analysis for our simulations. So here, what we see are uh, analysis of the equilibrium simulations, not the dissociation simulations. So here uh, in this axis, uh, we see the different inhibitors and here uh, interactions, uh, hydrogen bonds with different uh, residues and here hydrophobic interactions with different residues. And here uh, in this line, we have results for FAK. And in this line, uh, we have results for PYK2. And here uh, we can still uh, look at the residence times uh, for different inhibitors. So what I want to highlight to you here in this slide uh, are the results of the interactions with this leucine 567 and the equivalent leucine in PYK2, which is this leucine 570. So uh, the strength of the color represents uh, the amount of uh, snapshots where we saw a specific interaction. So uh, white means that this in this uh, interaction appeared in very few snapshots. And blue uh, means that this specific interaction appeared in almost all snapshots of the simulation. And what we can see here uh, is that for ligands with long residence times, like inhibitor one or inhibitor three here, we usually have uh, interactions uh, with leucine, leucine five, six, seven in almost uh, all snapshots. And then when we look back at the crystal structures, here we have our inhibitor one again, here it's bound to FAK, here it's bound to PYK2. And here we are comparing uh, two different scenarios. Uh, here uh, for FAK and ligand one, we have a low K of value, a large residence time. That's usually what we want in drug design. And here we have the opposite situation. So a high K of value, a short residence time. And what we can see when we look back at the position of leucine 567, uh, we see that uh, because of this helical DFG motif, leucine is close to the inhibitor. While here, uh, we don't even see this leucine. This leucine would be located somewhere here. And that's it. Uh, and just to make uh, another very brief story, not about kinase, but about C4 lysozyme, uh, we also applied tau render to T4 lysozyme uh, to see if we could get some interesting mechanistic insights about kinetic rates here. Uh, but T4 lysozyme has zero pharmaceutical interest. This is basically a toy system uh, for experimental computational people to uh, play around with ideas for uh, to study thermodynamics and kinetics. And then uh, if you want to see more about this, uh, this is also in the literature uh, in this paper. And first, what we did uh, was to see if tau Renzi could reproduce the experimental residence times, and we could, and it could, as you can see by this R square of 0 0.78. And here uh, we have uh, different uh, complexes of T4 of T4 lysozyme. So we don't usually work with the white type, but the mutants, because the mutants create this engineered cavity that can bind small molecules like benzene or indole. And then uh, we analyze the pathways uh, extensively, but I will not talk about the pathways today, but I want to talk about uh, the intermediate states that we found, especially for these com two complexes, because here we have a complex with a long residence time and here a complex uh, with short residence time. So each circle here uh, represents uh, a cluster or um, an intermediate state uh, we found for dissociation. And when we have uh, these clusters here, uh, one, two, three, four, it has low RMSD, mean, meaning that it basically represents the bound state. This cluster here, this three cluster represents intermediate states, and this dark cluster here represents the unbound state. So same goes here for this other complex. The first four cl clusters represent the bound state. We have three intermediate states and one unbound state. And here, I want you to pay attention to the uh, unbinding pathways that are basically represented by these thick gray arrows. So these gray arrows, uh, they represent probability fluxes uh, across the clusters. 
So the higher, uh, the thicker the arrow, the higher the flux uh, between the cluster is. So here, uh, for instance, the main pathway for unbinding would be from cluster four to cluster five, six, and then eight. So we basically have two intermediate states here. While here, uh, if we follow the thick arrows, the main pathway for unbinding would be from cluster two to five and two eight. So one intermediate state. So uh, what appears to be the case here is that uh, when we visit multiple intermediate states like this, uh, this case here, we have longer residence times. And this is something that could be eventually exploited in drug design. So if we want a drug with longer residence times, we could think about engineering uh, more uh, intermediate states for unbinding. And that's it. Now to quickly talk about uh, what's going on in my lab, we're still looking at kinases. Uh, one of the things we are looking right now uh, is checking uh, the role of this hydrogen bond uh, between lysine uh, 53 and aspartate 168 and seeing if this has a role in residence times. Uh, and for our, from previous uh, work of mine, uh, there seems to be a, a correlation between the presence of this uh, hydrogen bond intermediate, intermediated by water and long residence times for this uh, kinase. And we are also uh, playing around uh, with machine learning uh, to predict uh, kinetic rates uh, using random forest and different features to see uh, what kind of features could lead to the best models. And just to give you a quick example here, uh, one of the features we are using are basically features of this Python library called Mordred. And one of my master's students developed a very uh, nice scheme for feature selection. So we can see here that uh, when we don't do feature selection, we have uh, more than 1,000 features and the predictive power is not so great, uh, 0.65. But then when we apply this uh, scheme for feature selection, we go to another, uh, to a much better uh, predictive power of 0.82. And that's what I wanted to present to you today. So I hope I convinced you that binding kinetics is a very exciting topic in drug design. And second point is that computational methods can not only be used to predict kinetic rates, but to provide interesting mechanistic insights about kinetics and selectivity. And that's it, people. So yeah, Michaela uh, is working on the Peter Gates kinase, and Zara is here today, and Louis uh, are working on the machine learning for HSP90. And the previous work that I presented to you uh, for kinases was uh, done uh, when I was uh, postdoc in Rebecca's group, and it was a collaboration with Stefan Neck and Merck. And yeah, thanks to Unisyscat, uh, the cluster of excellence, which is now uh, paying my research group here in Berlin. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very, very nice talk. Um, so the talk is open for discussion. I have one question from the chat, but let's do the presence questions first. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This. this one, yeah. Yeah. Are there any Ah, that's a great question. And we did some mutations, and I think, um, but then the thing is that we just did mutations and measured the kinetic rates. So, uh, and the kinetic rates really get. Uh, much higher when we mutate this specific leucine, but then in no crystal structure. So not sure what happens there, but at least when we do the simulations, we also did simulations and yeah, we basically have a, a more unstable binding mode in the simulations. You're welcome. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Is this like an automatic uh, method, like something like PCA or Tika, or is it like knowledge based? Yeah, it's the subject of a future work, so I cannot talk about it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so we have three questions from the chat. Maybe I can just insert them here and after four questions, we can continue. Okay, four questions just popping up. Okay, the first question uh, is from Diman Ray. Uh, he asked, did you find any coupling between the ligand dynamics and the protein conformational change that affect the kinetics? I would think this will be important for kinases. Huh, yeah, so uh, at least for the case of FAK, uh, I didn't see any evidence uh, of this uh, coupling between uh, kinase dynamics and ligand dissociation, but this seems to be the case for P38, uh, especially because of this uh, hydrogen bond mediated by water. And yes, as, as far as I can remember for, from the literature, uh, some people, uh, we have found some uh, evidence between the opening and closure of uh, the binding sites of kinases and the residence times. And this, I think this is an exciting topic to study in kinases. Yep. Okay, so an, another question from the chat, maybe? Um, it's, uh, yeah, the question is, how did you choose model descriptors? By default, there are 1826 model features and some of them are 3D and 2D. How did you come up? with your uh, 1,228 model descriptors. So how did you reduce from 1826? Yeah, so we need, initially did some sort of reduction. So uh, we only looked at the 2D features because looking at the 2D features would require us to explore the conformations. And for now we are just avoiding it. So we just looked at 2D descriptors. This is one thing. And for our data sets, we also removed everything uh, that was zero or that, or that was equal for all the 17 inhibitors that we were looking at because this would not help to separate the inhibitors. So we did some initial uh, screening That's of perfect. features just to remove what, what would be useless. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I tried to parrot as a little bit. Uh, one more question is, did you observe any interaction between the ligand and protein surface during dissociation that may skew the residence time result? This is something I could partially observe in my Tau D simulations, says Gerald Keller. Ah, oh my God, that's so interesting. <laughs> no, I didn't, because uh, the thing is that uh, when we apply force, uh, uh, what happens is that, uh, at least in my Tau D simulations, is that uh, it the limiting factor to remove a ligand from the binding sites are usually, it's usually the bound state. So when you rupture the main interactions in the bound state, then the ligand comes out very quickly. And I never had the chance to see this exploration of the protein surface. But that's very interesting that he was able to see it. So yeah, I'm quite curious. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe you can, can uh, continue with that exchange. So I think we stopped the discussion at that point uh, for the sake of time. Um, yeah, but if there are more questions, there is still in the chat, chat on Zoom, so you can follow up mm -hmm. if you want. Okay, so, ah. right? Okay, I'll check it out. Okay. Thank you, people. So, and now I hand over to, yeah, thanks again. I hand over to Clara for the introduction of our next speaker and we'll try to update the presentation in the meantime. Yeah, hello also from my side in the room and online. My name is Clara Christ. Um, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker who will come into the camera with me in a second. <laughs> so Mikhail Andronov, he is, was trained as a chemist at uh, Moscow State University and uh, is now a PhD student with uh, Jürgen Schmidt-Huber at the University of Southern Italy, where he's working as part of the EU Horizon um, Project AI for drug discovery. And he's now in Berlin since a couple of weeks, months. And um, a couple of months working with my former colleague um, Oko Klevert at Pfizer. And yeah, we're happy to have you here. And Gerhard is still pulling up the slides, but it can only be seconds. Looking okay. forward to your talk.
Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Mikhail. Uh, I am a PhD student working jointly uh, in the University of Southern Switzerland uh, in the group of Professor Schmidt Huber uh, and uh, at Pfizer in Berlin in the group of uh, Dr. Uh, Clever. And uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the recent paper we published, and it was uh, about uh, reagent prediction with a transformer. A transformer is a neural network architecture. So the previous talk uh, was mostly about molecular dynamics, and this will be about deep learning. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, who uh, of you guys uh, do machine learning for chemistry? Are there people? Okay. Wonderful, thanks. We should definitely chat afterwards. So uh, uh, the main application of uh, uh, my work is reaction modeling. Uh, so, uh, chemists work with uh, organic synthesis and chemical reactions uh, all the time, both in academia and industry. And uh, the uh, computer-aided synthesis planning software is integral for the workflow of any pharma company. In reactions, there are commonly three sites, reactants, reagents, and products. Reactants turn into products, contributing atoms uh, Contributing atoms to the product. I won't convert things to I think here, obviously, that the multi to refer to this part. Okay, so I just have to remove this computer, I think, you know. Let's just rejoin the meeting in a minute.
Okay, so uh, okay, so we're back. So I was talking about uh, uh, reactions. And uh, um, as I said, in reactions, there are three sites, uh, reactants, reagents, and products. And uh, with machine learning, we can predict any missing part of the reaction. For example, we can predict the products given the reactants and reagents, and that will be the uh, task of forward synthesis prediction. We can just take the products and predict the reactant, reactants, and that uh, would be uh, the task of single step retrosynthesis. And we can also do reagent prediction. A reaction type is basically defined by the reaction center and the reagents. Reaction center being the atoms that change conductivity over the course of a reaction. And with different reagents, reactants can turn into different products. So uh, the task uh, of reagent prediction is uh, important uh, just as uh, single step retrosynthesis and forward prediction. So what is a transformer? A transformer is a neural network architecture initially designed for machine translation in 2017. Uh, the models of the transformer family are powering the tools like uh, ChatGPT and uh, uh, GitHub Copilot, for example. So they are very big in the machine learning industry right now. The transformer generates the, base, the um, basic transformer uh, from 2017, generates uh, a sequence given another sequence. So it transducts sequences, turns them into each other in an autoregressive way. It works on texts, which is split into tokens. Tokens could be uh, words or uh, uh, syllables or some other subword units or whatever else. And the encoder part of the transformer turns all tokens of the input sequence into vectors. And the decoder predicts what token in the output sequence goes next, given the input sequence and the output tokens decoded so far. There is a text notation for molecules and reactions called SMILES. Uh, this text notation was initially designed for uh, chemical information systems. And the, the idea behind this text representation is to build a spanning tree in a molecular graph, uh, like shown uh, on the uh, figure on the left. So if we represent uh, molecules with smiles, we can use deep learning models from natural language processing to process uh, chemical information. Now, for example, uh, here you can see how the how a, a reaction uh, would look like in the form of smiles. So uh, reactants on the left and products on the right separated by arrows. Why would we want to do reagent prediction for reactions? There is a literature on that. And uh, in the literature, uh, people would do it to optimize the performance of one reaction type uh, for yield or rate constant or anything else. And uh, in our work, we use the transformer to do reagent prediction uh, to first enhance CASP synthesis and then to address data flows. CASP is once again uh, computer-aided synthesis planning. And uh, on the slide, you can see a screenshot from an open source uh, synthesis planning software. So it uh, takes uh, uh, the rightmost molecule and predicts the reactants that could lead to that molecule. But it does it without any conditions or reagents, which uh, leaves a, a chemist wondering, how does one actually carry out such a transformation? And uh, with the reagent prediction model, 
we can enhance uh, a system like that in production. There is also a problem of uh, the data quality in reactions. So uh, the main data set used for reaction modeling, actually the only open and big enough data set right now, is the data set of reactions mined from US patents, which are uh, open, open source. And here you can see four examples of the Suzuki coupling from this data set. And uh, a Suzuki coupling requires a palladium catalyst, a base, and a solvent. The first reaction is fully specified. And the, in the second and the third reactions, a molecule is missing. And uh, the fourth reaction is uh, reported with no reagents whatsoever. And uh, this is not very good because uh, uh, we use this data for uh, models training for all kinds of purposes in reaction modeling. And the, the better the quality of the data is, the less noise there is, the better will be the results and the performance uh, of, uh, say, forward prediction models. And uh, a reagent model can uh, reintroduce the missing reagents to uh, reactions like the fourth one, uh, given the assumption that there are more well-reported well reactions in the data set than uh, the reactions that lack reagent. So uh, there is a paper uh, that we recently uh, published uh, in the Chemical Science Journal uh, done uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, another uh, AIDD fellow uh, from uh, uh, Helmholtz Center Munich and with the help uh, of uh, the Dr. Clevert and Professor Schmidt-Huber uh, that uh, uh, supervise uh, my work. So what was the paper idea? Uh, we use uh, two models, a reagent model and a product model. The product model the, is the model that predicts products for reactions, given reactants and reagents. And uh, both those models are transformers. We use a reagent model to improve uh, product, product prediction models by uh, assembling a data set that has, that has more uh, reagent information uh, than the uh, original data set. So uh, the original benchmark data set has some broken reagents and we fix them by a reagent model and then we compare two product models, one trained uh, on the initial data set and the other on the fixed one and we observe the improvement in performance on of the second model. In principle this approach is model agnostic so it's not necessary to use uh, transformers specifically in principle. For the training, we used uh, the uh, reactions from the open USPTO dataset. And uh, the uh, size of the dataset uh, was uh, 1 million reactions, about 1 million reactions. Uh, the input sequences to the transformers, to the transformer, uh, are reactions without reagents. And the target sequence uh, is uh, uh, the sequence of uh, reagent molecules, everything written in form of smiles. And this is for the reagent model. For the product model, uh, the source is uh, reactants and product, uh, reactants and reagents, and the model predicts products. And that's how different uh, they are. Uh, the models are implemented in the package OpenNMTPy, and uh, uh, the sequences are tokenized atom-wise. Uh, so uh, for preprocessing, we first uh, take all the reactions in USPTO and uh, uh, mix together reagents and product. Uh, mix together reactants and reagents. Uh, then we uh, reassign reagents using a special procedure uh, because uh, the uh, separation of reagents and reactants in the original data is uh, uh, not uh, that uh, good and uh, not preferable. We, we canonicalize all molecules remove atom mapping, drop isotopes, and uh, uh, remove reagents which are too rare, uh, drop reactions that ended up being without reagents at all, we drop duplicate reactions. Then we do some data augmentation by augmenting smiles and uh, just making the copies of reactions with uh, uh, the same smiles but uh, uh, equivalent 
and uh, not actually strictly the same, but equivalent. Then we also order reagents by uh, role priorities, meaning that catalyst go first, then uh, go oxidizing agents and reducing agents, and then go acids and bases, and uh, solvents go last. Then we tokenize the reaction. A reaction role assignment um, is done uh, uh, by a special fingerprint-based procedure does, that does not rely on atom mapping. Uh, because the original atom mapping in the data set is uh, pretty flawed and we cannot really rely on it when doing uh, roles separation. As the test set, we used a subset uh, of uh, the uh, uh, proprietary reaxis database, assuming that uh, the quality of the data, uh, meaning the uh, meaning how well reagents are reported. The quality of the data is better in uh, reaxis. So uh, we assembled about 100,000 reactions from reaxis and uh, classified all the reactions into 10 major reaction classes and then tried to make the distribution of, re of reaction classes in the test set resemble a common benchmark data set USPTO 50K. We cannot really test the model on USPTO itself because uh, um, the ground truth sequences, the reagents would be just as noisy as in the training set. So uh, the model would often give a prediction which is actually correct, but it wouldn't count as a hit because the ground truth sequence is incorrect itself. That's why we use a different test set or which uh, uh, doesn't have uh, such a problem or at least uh, does or at least it doesn't manifest uh, uh, that, uh, that big in that data set. To evaluate uh, the reagent prediction model, we used three metrics. Uh, one is the exact match accuracy. A hit uh, is a hit when, it, uh, when the prediction matches the ground truth string exactly. Then there is partial match accuracy. Uh, there is a hit when some of the molecules are predicted correctly. And there is uh, the recall, uh, the number uh, of the correctly predicted molecules divided by the number of molecules in target. And uh, uh, the transformer can generate an arbitrary number of uh, different sequences for the same output. Uh, and uh, those sequences are ordered by their probability. And uh, here we uh, decode five sequences for each input sequence and report uh, the uh, accuracy in in top five cases. And top one accuracy, uh, we get 17% uh, uh, of uh, uh, exact match accuracy on USPTO. And in top, top five exact match accuracy is 33.5%, meaning that uh, in 33.5% of the reactions, the ground truth sequence was found within the five options or the by probability. The partial match accuracy is much higher. And the top five partial match accuracy is 88.9%. So uh, the overwhelming majority of, rea of reactions in the test set are somewhat predicted correctly by the model. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the exact match accuracy is not a very adequate metric for uh, such a task because for every reaction, there uh, might be many options for reagents that make this reaction possible. Uh, the performance uh, across different reaction types uh, uh, stays uh, pretty uh, similar. Um, uh, the uh, most, uh, the highest uh, exact match accuracy is observed by uh, heteroatom alkylation and arylation reactions. And the highest uh, uh, partial match accuracy is observed for CC bond formations. And uh, 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 even for reactions that are underrepresented in the test set, uh, like uh, oxidations and heterocycle formation, there is decent performance. A trained model actually improves reagents for the reactions in the USPTO. These are four examples of reactions that we 
find uh, in the uh, USPTO subset that we are going to use for training the model for product prediction. The first example is uh, uh, a reaction of uh, peptide coupling. And uh, generally, uh, these sorts of reactions require some kind of a catalyst uh, dehydrating agent like uh, HATU, HOBT, and, uh, or some uh, 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 other options. So there is an entire family of them. Uh, the original reagents reported in the data set are written in red, and in green are the reagents predicted by our model. So in the first reaction, there was no necessary catalyst in the originally reported sequence. And the model uh, re reintroduces it without uh, messing up uh, the other uh, required reagents. Uh, the second reaction uh, is uh, an instance of reductive amination reported initially with no actual reducing agent. And uh, our model um, reintroduces that to the reaction. Um, the third and the fourth reactions are instances of Suzuki coupling and Sonogashira coupling, respectively. They were reported with no reagents, but the model uh, proposes uh, the standard uh, Wikipedia reagents for both those transformations. Uh, the strategy that we used for reagent replacement uh, is a, a simple one, and probably there are a much more powerful uh, strategies out there. But what we did, we just replaced uh, uh, the reagents if more molecules were predicted by the model in the top one case, then there was then there were reported. And this way, reagents changed in twenty five percent of reactions in the uh, USPTO set that we are going to use to train a product prediction model. And uh, uh, we uh, trained, uh, as I've already said, two transformers for product prediction models, for product, for product prediction on USPTO. And uh, uh, the model that was trained on the data set with improved reagents achieved a higher score on both uh, the Reaxis uh, test set and the uh, USPTO test set. Uh, the improvement is uh, not uh, that uh, high. It's, it, it didn't uh, get that many percent points, but uh, it's consistent and it's supported by a statistical test. Um, a McNamara test uh, to be uh, entirely correct. And there is also an interesting, find, an interesting finding uh, that uh, um, if we remove all reagents from the USPTO training set for a product prediction model and uh, train a product prediction model just on reactants, we achieve 84% top one exact match accuracy on USPTO, which is uh, just uh, about four percent points less than if we did use reagents. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting finding, telling us that uh, reagents may be not that uh, not as important as we might think. However, they uh, are responsible for some part of the correct uh, predictions. What are the problems with our setting? First, uh, generated smiles that come out of the transformer may, in principle, be invalid smiles, meaning that they don't correspond to any molecule. But uh, uh, this uh, was not the problem in practice for our transformer. It learned to always output valid smiles. And then, uh, if one uses this model in production, it would be hard to add unseen reagents meaning that if you want to use some new reagent that was not in the training set, you would have to retrain uh, the entire model uh, from scratch uh, because uh, this uh, transformer model cannot invent new reagents. Then slow inference time uh, is uh, common for all transformers and uh, you can mitigate it with more uh, computational power. And then there is also much overlap between the top N generated sequences. And there is a need for other better evaluation techniques. For example, what do you do if the model predicts uh, an alternative solvent, which is 
just very similar to the ground truth solvent and uh, can uh, make the reaction happen, but uh, there is no way you can uh, count that as a hit where the string matching uh, performance measures. So to conclude, uh, in the paper, we first studied uh, the capabilities of the transformer in the task of reagent prediction of organic reactions. And we demonstrated the influence of the reagent trackers on product prediction. The code is on GitHub. Uh, you can uh, check it out uh, and use. Um, there are pre-trained models and that uh, you can just run for any reaction that you have. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for this very useful, very insightful talk as well. And um, I have a question for how I understood it. This can be used to find reagents for a reaction that you don't know the reagents uh, for yet. But can you also use the model to find more optimal reagents for a reaction? So, like, I already have a reaction. And I somehow want to have a bad yield, and I want more or better, better yield. Yes, yes, I guess so. Uh, for example, if uh, well, if you supply a reaction into the model, it will always produce some output for you. It will always uh, generate some reagents, and uh, in like an arbitrary number or in, in an arbitrary number of attempts, you will get different reagents. And as a chemist, you can assess uh, how uh, much better there might be in your reaction. If uh, there are many reactions similar to yours in the data set that uh, uh, go with high yields and use certain reagents, the model will propose that re those reagents. And uh, it will uh, certainly gravitate toward uh, the cases that are that were more abundant in the training set. Yeah. Is it? It's also in smiles format. It has uh, some uh, uh, separation between reactants and reagents. And it has some atom mapping. It just uh, you might find uh, both of those uh, inadequate for your task. But in principle, uh, all this, all the data is in the smiles format. Also, yield is reported for those for for those reactions. And uh, um, the patent number and the year, but no other conditions such as uh, temperature, pressure, concentrations, no and no experimental procedures. So uh, that's why. Uh, we only predict reagents uh, in this paper. If uh, there was more data in the USPTO, like uh, the temperature or the pressure or anything else, we will just uh, do the entire conditions prediction routine. Uh, this uh, uh, task was posed as supervised classification uh, uh, working on molecular fingerprints in a paper from 2018. Uh, uh, the the pe people used uh, uh, a restricted uh, set of reagents and uh, the data from Reaxis, not from USPTO. And they also uh, ordered uh, their predictions by roles. So a uh, metal catalyst is predicted first, for example, and a solvent is predicted last. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, it was interesting to see how the transformer performs in this case, and uh, the transformer just works on an entirely different domain. It works on embeddings of tokens in smiles and not on fingerprints, and those carry different information. Uh, uh, would fingerprints be better than smiles? Uh, smirks and smiles. Uh, smirks and smiles. Uh, sm smirks and smiles. Uh, uh, when I talk about them, I use uh, smiles as a replacement for smirks. So smirks is like smiles for re reactions, and uh, those those the same smiles but with two extra arrows. So I just call them smiles. Yeah. 
might be different. Yeah, okay. So maybe a short question in that direction. I mean, you had this augmentation step, uh, which means that you basically create uh, different atom ordering smiles to teach the transformer basically the smile syntax, right? So that they don't, the purpose of that is that it learns smiles, right? So that it doesn't generate wrong smiles in the end. Yes, exactly. That's the purpose of that augmentation. Because we had, we had a lot of discussions, I think, at all these chemical medics meetings, right? The ICCS at the RDK user group meeting on what are the artifacts in smiles that we could improve to make like one hot encoded smile as the canonical form of representing chemical structures for machine learning? Uh, better. So, so do you have a feeling on which parts or how would you redesign? I mean, everybody, all approaches that use smiles, encoded smiles work better than in descriptor approaches. Just, I mean, that's my impression if I read the literature. Um, but do you have an impression on what you could do to avoid this data augmentation step or represent molecule graphs in a compact way? without having the artifact of smiles. I mean, it learns brackets wrong and so on, right? So it's confused by numbers and brackets, actually. Yeah. Um, and do you have an idea on how the optimal molecular representation for machine learning could look like? I uh, don't uh, have uh, a novel idea to solve the problem myself. However, yeah. there were uh, attempts in the literature to do that. For example, there is Deep Smiles, a variant of smiles yeah. that doesn't require uh, the model to uh, close uh, the to the brackets, brackets yeah. to parentheses, yeah. and uh, there there is the uh, uh, selfies notation that mm -hmm. always uh, that it's very different to smiles, but it's also a text notation. And by design, it any selfie string is a valid molecule. And uh, there was uh, also an attempt in uh, building a transformer variant with uh, a graph encoder instead of a smiles encoder. Mm -hmm. So uh, the one that just uh, takes the molecular graph as input and not the sequence of smiles. And uh, in that way, you won't have to augment the source sequences for this transformer. Uh, so, uh, uh, But this does it, does it build the... valid graphs then? I mean, hmm? does it build valid graphs then in the end? I mean, the question is, just, I mean, how many augmentation steps did you include here? Just in your... uh, one uh, augment reaction for every reaction. So twice okay. uh, the... Uh, in, so you just in, choose, choose a random different starting atom? Yes, just for, a random different starting atom. Uh, there is, uh, in the literature, it uh, has been shown that uh, it's just enough augmentation. Much okay. more augmentations uh, is not necessary to improve the performance. Of and you never had an invalid smile in your um, prediction. In the checkpoint uh, that we report uh, in this, uh, for the for the model checkpoint uh, uh, that we evaluated in the paper, uh, we uh, obtain no invalid smiles on the test set. Okay. Uh, but uh, other checkpoints occasionally may output uh, some invalid smiles. Mm -hmm. And invalid smiles mean syntactically invalid or wrong valences or something? Just a syntactically invalid, like okay. uh, a cycle isn't closed or something. Yeah. Okay, shall we? Okay, so we have three more questions from the chat. Uh, the first one, nice talk. Speaking about problems you mentioned, why we cannot find you in the model with a new reagent but should train from scratch? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, we, we can, of course, uh, fine tune the model with the new reagent, uh, uh, starting with the checkpoint that we already have. Yeah, I just meant that uh, we have to do some more training. We cannot just uh, uh, use uh, uh, the new reagent in a zero shot way. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next question, as you mentioned, there are various issues, biases, and limitations with some of these published reaction data sets. I think we discussed that already a little bit. Do you see a chance to apply your approach in an active learning scenario and how and, and to suggest experiments that should be done in the lab to validate your method? Uh, yeah, the uh, lab validation of the reactions that are improved uh, uh, with this method uh, is uh, something that would, in principle, uh, have to be done. Because uh, when the model uh, outputs some reagents for a reaction, there is no guarantee that this reaction will actually uh, be possible. And you need to validate it in the lab. But this was beyond, beyond the scope of the paper. And uh, uh, you can probably attach uh, all sorts of uh, active learning loops uh, to the task of uh, date cleaning. but uh, 
and uh, that was also beyond the scope. But uh, this is just uh, a simple, a simple solution that we proposed. To just uh, add more uh, reagents uh, to the very data set uh, the reagent uh, model was trained on. Of course, everything would be possible. But it's just mm -hmm. one way of doing that. Okay, and the third one. Do you think transformers are the best algorithm for this if you tried other algorithms and compared outcomes? Um, I am trying other algorithms uh, at the moment uh, for future papers, and uh, those uh, methods um, are mm, have the purpose uh, of solving the problems that I mentioned uh, uh, on uh, one on the corresponding slide. Um, the, but uh, I, I'm not ready to answer the question on the comparison of different models for such uh, a task yet, because not all the experiments have been done so far. Yeah. But uh, I think that uh, the transformer is not the best model for uh, this uh, task uh, because of the problems that uh, I mentioned. Yeah. Okay, very nice answer. Thanks a lot. So yeah, so I don't see any more questions here. I don't see any more questions in the chat. There's, there's a ah. <laughs> yeah, very nice. So we'll try we'll try the reaction here. <laughs> Basic research. Okay, so thanks again to both speakers for these amazing talks and thanks for the very, very nice uh, discussion. Okay. Um, and don't forget the networking part. Um, so stay online in the meeting in Zoom. So those that are virtually participating and uh, if you're here, please join us to read if possible. Okay, see you next time. Check the website for updates.